Willkommen zurück auf VOTD, der Podcast für deinen Mehrwert. Heute mit einer ganz besonderen Folge. Wie ihr seht, wir sind wieder auswärts unterwegs. Das heißt, wir treffen jemanden. Heute treffen wir jemand ganz Besonderes. Dr. Yassir Kadi, einen, den ich schon seit Jahren verfolge. Für mich einer mit der besten Speaker, die es gibt, was islamische Theologie betrifft. Er hat in Yale studiert, seinen Doktortitel gemacht in Chemie. Er hat in Medina studiert, auch seinen Doktortitel gemacht. Und ich freue mich heute auf diese Folge mit Dr. Yasser Kadi. Bleibt da dran. Eins muss ich euch noch sagen. Diese Folge findet auf Englisch statt. Schaltet den Untertitel ein, abonniert, kommentiert und teilt diese Folge, dass ihr erfolgreich werdet. Bleibt bis zum Ende auf jeden Fall dran. Da kommt eine ganz spannende Frage noch. Bis dann. Danke fürs Einschalten. Our podcast is, is the name is value of the day. For OTD is the value for the day. That's why we want to try to give all people, not, or not only Muslims, all people, all nurses, to give them a value, that they take value to grow spiritually, to grow uh, in, in success, to grow mentally. And I hope and I'm very sure that today we get a lot of values from you. Inshallah. 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 Okay, I prepare some questions. Can you tell us about your journey to become a scholar? Hmm. Okay. Bismillah, uh, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa minu wa lahma ba'd. It is my honor and pleasure to be here in Germany, my first uh, tour that I'm doing. And uh, today is in the city of uh, Frankfurt, obviously, alhamdulillah. So I appreciate uh, t you taking time. I know you drove a while for to, to be with me as well. So may Allah uh, bless you for that effort as well. Uh, I have spoken about my journey uh, in a much more detail in other lectures. To be very quick here, because they can listen to it in other lectures, that I was born and raised in Houston, Texas. Uh, and uh, I did my chemical engineering degree and during that time frame I became more religious and more interested in the academic study of Islam but this was in the early 90s and there wasn't uh, the opportunity to study Islam within America in the 90s now there's many but back then there was nothing and so I decided to uh, not pursue a job in engineering I had finished the degree worked at Dow Chemical which was the competitor to BASF I know this from my team yes, yes, our competitor yes. was BASF back then right so we're at Dow Chemical it was BASF from Germany yeah yes. uh, so um, uh, then I, I decided to pursue a degree in Islamic studies and the first the purpose was to learn myself what my religion says the purpose was that I myself um, become knowledgeable of my faith there was no goal to become a scholar for other people. There was no goal to give public da'wah. There was no goal to be a, uh, a person that was known or influential. No, I just wanted to study for myself. Mm -hmm. But subhanAllah, one thing led to another and I ended up spending 10 years uh, in Medina, did a bachelor's and then a master's in theology. And then 9-11 happened and I realized that I really needed to come back and start preaching and teaching because there was so much misunderstanding about Islam. And so I returned to America and did my uh, PhD at uh, Yale University and uh, have been very active in da'wah, and I find uh, a lot of challenges and a lot of comfort. This is what I find is where I find my my peace is to be able to benefit as many people as I can, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the next question. Um, in this specific um, answer, what you give, what challenges you do, did face along the way and how you overcome them? So there are many challenges at the personal level, at the um, uh, public level. Of course, at the personal level, obviously it's very, um, very scary to jump into an unknown world, an unknown language, an unknown culture, and also to break away from the stability of a career and a job. Because I had an offer from Dow Chemical and I had to give that up. And you, you don't know the future. It's a very jump into the dark. You don't know what's going to happen. But this is when you put your trust in Allah and you say, Allah has something you know, better planned for me. You know, um, uh, Definitely along the way. And then obviously family sacrifice. I had to be away from my parents for a while. Uh, had to you know uh, delay marriage and then get married to a wife that was willing to live in difficult circumstances, very difficult circumstances there financially, whatnot. You know, the, the, to go through that, these are all at a personal level, a sacrifice that you have to do, and you have to have a sincerity and commitment. And I hope that Allah Azza wa Jalla bless me with that. Otherwise, it's not mm -hmm. possible to overcome. You know, there are other challenges as well, and of those challenges is now now that the person that I am uh, to be in the public limelight. You know. You don't, I didn't ask for this, I didn't intend for this, but you are now a very prominent person. And everything you say and do is analyzed by many different people. You cannot please everybody. No matter what you say, you will always find people that are going to jump and attack. So we now have the problem of trying to balance, you know, uh, this very, very difficult battle about public opinion perception. And you come to the realization that, you know what? 
The goal is not the public. The goal is not uh, to appease groups of people. The goal is to preach what I believe is the truth for the sake of Allah. And let's face the consequences after that. And that is a challenge because there are so many pushbacks from so many different groups of people. Literally every few days, I have to face another attack or slander or lie, or maybe even it's a correct point which is disagreed by groups of people, you know. Uh, my stance on Gaza is going to get the Zionist against me, for example, right? And I don't appreciate that, but it is what it is. You have to face that and they slander and this and that. And then within the Muslim community, I have positions that are obviously my opinions, and there are many people that disagree. Some can disagree with etiquette, that's fine. But others, they don't, they don't follow etiquette. And so they will disagree in a manner that they want to portray you as a bad person, an evil person. I don't agree with this way of doing it, but that's the way they have decided to do it. I have to deal with that now, that lies are said, slander is said, and you have to just deal with it. So these are all challenges that we face uh, along the way. But I look at it that those who are preaching Islam have chosen to walk in the footsteps of the prophets. And that's a very, very, very big honor. And with that honor comes the baggage. Mm. And the prophets, all of them, were persecuted by their own peoples. So those who walk in the path of the prophets, don't you think they're going to get a little bit, just a little bit of that as well? It comes with the territory. So you have to deal with it and you have to always go back over here. Why am I doing this? What is the purpose? And if this is good then the rest is irrelevant. And if this is not good, then who cares what the people say or do? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, another question, because um, like you say, in the back, the ulama, when they have different opinions, there was no problem. They respect each other. Also when very, very hard, different opinions in, in some subjects. And now, in, for me, it's, it's, it's a very difficult time. Mm. They take some something from some scholar and put him like you say that he's evil, that he's mm. bad. How how what do you think? Why we are in this time? Well, it's very obvious why, and that is that the majority of the people that are doing this are not scholars. I can meet a scholar of any persuasion, and we can agree to disagree with the Islamic adab. Yes, but when the person is not a scholar, he's a, a, a social media influencer. He's a young kid who wants to become famous online. He doesn't have any credentials. Yeah. The goal then is not scholarly debate. It's views and likes. The goal is views and likes. And I have said this 10 years ago, and I've said it five years ago, and I'll say it today. Well, not 10, maybe eight years ago, whenever YouTube began. Not a single YouTube refutation against me, not one of those people has ever reached out behind the scenes and said, let's discuss. N nobody. Not one. Not one. They want only public. They want only. This is not the way. I have had plenty of people who disagree with my opinions, and their ulama or tulab al-ilm, they contact me either directly, indirectly, meet me. They look, Sheikh. I want to understand why you say this, and we have a back and forth. Never once has a person of knowledge come to me one on one, except that either I change my opinion. Or he understands why. Or even at the worst case scenario, we agree to disagree because he sees where I'm coming from. I see where he's coming from. Yes, yes. Right? Never once has this ever happened. If you meet one on one, you're both sincere. Either you convince me, I convince you, or at least you say, okay, I disagree, but I see where you're coming from. Correct? This is what happens. Yeah, of, right? of course. Now, well, then, if you're not interested in actual akhlaq and ilm, you just want your own niche and celebrity and money through YouTube, whatever it might be, fame, yeah. then I can't this, cater this, to that. Right? This so is in German. I can all, only speak the view from Germany. It's a very big problem. Yeah. Very, very big problem what we have here. Is it the same also in, in US or in international? I don't think it's a very big problem. It is a problem. It's not the biggest problem we have. It is a nuisance. It's an irritation. Because in the end of the day, these people, their influence is imaginary in the social world, media world. It's not in the actual masajid, in the actual lives of the people, right? These people, actually, we don't even know where they pray and which conventions they go. They are not in, involved in the real lives of people. Mm. Their influence is amongst people that are sitting at home doing nothing. So if you're sitting at home and doing nothing, then you feel good by talking bad about other people. Mm. But the people that are actually involved in the physical world, the real world, They're involved. They don't have time to criticize. Yaqi, if you're doing something for the ummah, I'm doing something for the ummah, may Allah bless you, make dua for me, and we'll move on. But 
when I'm doing nothing and I see you, I have so much time. So then I get online and say, ah, look, this, you know, brother Omar, mm. he's this, he's that. So Searching is, for something yeah, wrong. Yeah, so the real world, big... the flesh and blood people, they are not affected by this. So it's not our biggest problem. But there is a problem that happens, and that is that innocent youth who don't know any better, they're coming to Islam, and they don't know all of these different. So they might hear some of your critics, and they don't understand, and they're going to, oh, I thought I liked Umar so much, I listened to his talk, but now this guy, he also has a beard, he also looks Islamic. Now he's pointing out that Umar is a, you know, this, and so this is the point. The confusion happens yeah. there. My Listen, in the end of the day, it's not my job to convince anybody of anything. It's my job to preach the truth. Whoever wants, alhamdulillah, whoever doesn't, alhamdulillah. So my job is to have just quality content, call to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with wisdom and gentle preaching, and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't spend too much time, you know. Um, in fact, I have never once engaged with these uh, critics like directly in the same manner they do. Maximum, I might respond generically so that people understand. So whoever has any doubts and is interested, go listen to the lectures that I have because I have pretty much answered all of these issues, misunderstandings. Whoever doesn't have the time, my advice is go choose the scholars you trust and follow them. No problem. Alhamdulillah. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenge Muslims face today? Uh, this is a very big question and it cannot be answered until you start limiting which group of Muslims are you talking about. <laughs> There's too many challenges, right? So I will s rephrase the question. What are the challenges of Western Muslims? Yes. This is now a bit easier for us to then yes, deal yes, with. Yes, okay? yes, yes. The challenges of Western Muslims are many. Uh, of them are internal and external. Internally, the biggest challenge that we have is to maintain our faith. We are losing too many of our youth to uh, non-religious lifestyles. And that is a loss to them and to us. The biggest challenge we face is that so many of our Muslim uh, members of our own community are not fully practicing the faith the way, the way they need to. And many of them are actually... Astaghfirullah, not even to the minimal level, like praying Jum'ah even. Of what use are you to the Ummah if you can't even show your face in the masjid? You might as well not be there. We need you back. We need your presence. So our biggest challenge is lack of spirituality, lack of Iman. Iman is being weak and weakened. This is our number one challenge. A number two challenge that we have is that we are disunited. So even those that are religious, they are just doing individual ibadat and worship, but they don't have a collective effort to do something. So we lack vision and leadership. We lack strategy. You know, and this is a problem that can, can be solved, and I hope, inshallah, it is being solved. But this requires initiative. It requires leadership. It requires gaining the momentum of the community so that they can come behind you. So these are two challenges internally. Externally, one of the biggest challenges we have is that, obviously, our political uh, loyalties to our governments, uh, we need to have very frank conversations like what does it mean to be an American Muslim? And my country is now problematizing some aspects of my faith. And I have to balance that negotiation. And that's a very difficult reality to do. Then my country's foreign policy is another reality, right? This is a very massive challenge. And it, it leads to an entire spectrum of responses. Some of them are good, some of them are bad, some of them are, you know, gray, we don't know. So again, these are challenges that we are uh, uh, facing. Uh, we don't have, and this is, I mentioned this before, but also as an external, we don't have a unified understanding really, and not even, let me just say even, I was going to say a unified understanding of, of, of Islam. Perhaps even that is not a goal or requirement, but we, we, we the challenge we have is, how do we deal with this diversity? Because, one of the things that the Muslim communities in the West, generally speaking, most of them are from countries other than the West, and then their parents or grandparents came here, yes. right? Where their parents and grandparents came from, the way Islam was understood and practiced is relatively uniform. In their village, which was one way. But all of these different villages, their grandchildren find themselves here in Frankfurt. Your grandfather was somewhere else, his grandfather was somewhere else, my grandfather was somewhere else. So the way Islam was uniform is no longer uniform. We have all of these differences internally. To make matters worse, there are many areas externally that our grandfathers never even talked about. What, what, what do you, how do you get involved in the political realm of your country? What are the dread lines? 
How can you get involved when you must compromise some areas in order to benefit other areas? These are challenges that are new. Of course. And they deal with the society we live in. And once again, we have the spectrum of opinion about how to deal with them. Right? So these are external challenges that will require us to be ingenious, to turn to our scholarship that is able to recognize these are ijtihadat, new opinions. That we're going to have to break away from our classical books. Not because we disrespect the classical books, mm. but because the classical books don't answer what does it mean to be a German Muslim. How can you get involved in your local politics? What do you do when you navigate through the laws of your country? Some of which ethically might conflict with your faith. This is new territory. It's a new challenge. What do we do? So again, we have the simplistic answers. You know, go back or do this or what that. Well, that doesn't answer the question. Go back where to the war-torn countries? Go back to what? You know. So not everybody. Everybody not can everybody make a hijrah. Not everybody has a go back. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Not everybody. And frankly, yeah. it's not just about not everybody can make hijrah, but. Yeah. We have to look at where will we be the most influential amongst ourselves and the ummah. And the brutal reality is, we can most of us, not everybody, most of us can accomplish more for ourselves, our families, our deen, and our dunya in the West. The West has more potential to benefit religiously, and yes, dunya-wise. And there's nothing wrong to want to benefit dunya-wise, right? I don't want bombs falling on my heads and my kids' heads. I make dua for those that are facing that. I don't want that. I don't want to be in a place where there's civil war, where I have to face starvation. Nobody should want that. It is ridiculous to want that. So if you are in a place where you're able to live comfortably and worship Allah comfortably, it is against the sharia to go migrate to a land where you will not be able to provide for your kids or may God forbid you're going to be subjecting your kids to... Uh, it's forbidden. It is not allowed. Not allowed. You have to protect your family. We make dua for those that are there. We help those that are there that are facing that, right? Our hearts are with them. Of course. But... You don't take your wife and kids and throw them over there. That would not be, it would be foolish and un-Islamic. Yeah, so sense. this, the, again, the, I'd say this because you were, said the word hijrah, and it needs to be said bluntly here. Hijrah to where? To where exactly? And for how long? You have German citizenship. The countries you are thinking about will not give you citizenship. And the problems you will face there are going to be of a different nature. You think that when you go there, everything will be fine. You haven't lived there. When you go there, you will realize there's corruption. There's bribery, there's tyranny, there's injustice, there's racism. I'm just giving examples, I'm not speaking specifically, right? And you will face a whole other set of problems. The world is not Jannah. Jannah is up ahead of you. This world, you will always have problems. So the problems of Germany, you have been born and raised here, so you are able to deal with those problems. Of course. If you were to go at this age and stage of your life to another country, all of a sudden, a whole new set of problems that you're not used to. You're going to have to face. And you're like, why did I even come here? So, concept of hijrah needs to be discussed. I've spoken about it in other lectures. Hijrah becomes obligatory when you're not able to worship Allah. And you have a land where you are able to worship Allah. So, if a time comes in a country where the country says, we, we cannot allow Muslims. You cannot pray. You cannot fast Ramadan. We will force you. And there are countries that are doing this to various Muslim minorities. In that case, if you're able to go to another land, go to another land. Otherwise, as long as you are able to practice your faith, and practice your faith means the five arkan, and nobody forces you to do the major sins. You're not being forced to kill, to drink wine, to whatnot. Uh, the other stuff, it's everywhere. Minor sins are everywhere. You don't think, go, if you go anywhere else, you'll also face minor, minor sins. Yeah, so, so the reality, therefore, is that hijrah, it sounds like a good option, but the default is that religious Western Muslims religious because if you're not religious then maybe you should go in and, and live in a Muslim land so that you have some Islam and Iman but those that know the word hijrah are automatically religious because it's a fiqhi term right those that are thinking about hijrah automatically means they have some Iman which means we need you to remain where you are because the people of Iman need to spread Iman in this land okay does that answer your question? yeah, yeah of course thank you very much I see lots of uh, people here in Germany they make four years hijrah 90% of them come back And the 10% that don't regret leaving and they only do so because there's some good money over there. 99%. I speak from my own experiences, mm. 25 years of this living this type of life, 30 mm. years to be honest. I do not know of a single person in my own extended acquaintances and friends who legitimately made hijrah for Islamic reasons and then loved it. 
Temporarily is one thing. Few years, come back. Yeah. But permanently, I don't know of any. The <laughs> default, they go and they're like, oh, we made a mistake. <laughs> Quietly come back and just like, you know. <laughs> Quietly, yes. So it's the way it is. Yeah. And Sheikh, uh, what steps can people take to grow spiritually and connecting more with the faith? So growing spiritually is a constant journey. It's not just a one-off struggle. And obviously, uh, there are two broad areas where one finds spiritual comfort. The first of them is in personal rituals, and the second of them is in helping other people. These are the two broad areas, and all of our ibadat are around these two areas. The first of them, salah, dhikr, Quran, tahajjud, this is, must be done. And the second of them, helping others in need, being productive with your community, giving back, bringing smiles on people's faces, finding a widow and helping them out, getting a refugee family who cannot speak the language and say, okay, I'll help you out in this regard. That is just as important for cleansing the soul and finding happiness. And the two have to go hand in hand. All too often, people concentrate on the one and they ignore the other. That's not Islam. Islam is both at the same time. And if you find that the one of them is a bit more difficult than the other, as long as you're doing the bare minimum, then find comfort in the other. As long as you're praying your prayers, and then you find comfort in being active in social work, being active in charity, being active in the media, and helping the Muslim community defend itself, right? That is an act of worship and ibadah. And you will find spirituality in that because you will literally constantly have to be defending the ummah. For example, how can there not be spirituality there? You hmm. feel the nobility in doing something for the ummah. So spirituality is found in both of these areas, and it is a constant struggle, constant battle, And that's the goal. In fact, the, we can literally say the goal of this religion is to perfect our spirituality. Allah says in the Quran, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى Both of them are there. That the one who has purified the soul is the one who is successful. This is the goal of Islam. Purif purification of the soul is exactly what this religion is about. So the soul is purified by connecting with Allah and by helping the creation of Allah. This is how the soul is purified. All creation. All the not creation. Not Muslims, not... All the creation. All Saudi, Subhanallah, not, we do yeah. not separate when it comes to a hungry child, whether you're a Muslim child or a non-Muslim child. We do not separate when it comes to yani, giving back to the creation that, oh, what is your aqidah, let me check. No, <laughs> the whole creation, you give back to them. And in that, you will find comfort and spirituality. I feel there is a, a lot of misunderstanding. Yes, 100%. In, in, this, in, this, in this case. And what advice do you have for young Muslims to reaching uh, for their place in society? My advice is very simple. Be proud of being Muslim. It's halal to be proud. It's wajib to be proud of this. Don't be embarrassed of Islam. Be proud of being a Muslim. And then excel in whatever field you find passion in. Excel in that field and be a Muslim in that field. That's what we need you to do. We need you to... Every single field can imagine... You find your passion in life. Aim for the highest aim you can. Be the best you can be in your particular field. All of you, you have been created differently. Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran that every one of you have given you know differences. We created every single one of you differently. And Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions that every one of you has been given different things. And so each one can benefit from the other. So your talents and passions are different than my talents and passions, which is different than his talents and passions. And society flourishes because of that diversity. We cannot expect everybody to think the same, talk the same, act the same, have the same passions. We want you to discover your passions, know what you want to do, aim high, then be the best you can be while you're proud of your Islam. As you rise up, you become successful, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a businessman, whether you're a scientist, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a sheikh and alim, whether you're a worker in your field, whatever you are, we need you to be the best you can be, the best in your dunya and the best in your deen. Best akhlaq, best compassion, best manners, best smile, best friendliness. Let everybody love you for the sake of your akhlaq and then they'll say, where do you get this from? Why are you so different? Yes. Say, ah, this is because I want to follow my Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is what we want the youth to do. Um, what is the future of Islam in the West and how can we spread the positive message? The, yes. da the da'wah, the way to call to Allah, 99% is action, 1% is speech. Most of us flip the script and we think 
da'wah is debates, speaking. Yes, yes. No. 99% of da'wah is just akhlaq. Just being the best person you 99%. can 99%. Look at the reality. How do people convert? They meet yeah, a when Muslim. You, when you, they meet a Muslim, then they find something different. There's a spark. Like yeah, the feeling. The feeling. The, 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 purity, get the heart. The purity, yeah. which comes from interaction yeah. and akhlaq. And then they ask, well, what is this? Oh, I'm a Muslim. What is Islam? That then comes there. 99%. That means... All what we see now around the world, the, the debates and the arguments and the I ask you a simple question. How many people watching those videos and lectures actually convert to Islam? Look at the converts in your own masjid. To be honest, I, I don't know, but okay. I, I, think it's, it's, I, think, I think it's more entertainment. Exactly. The people looking only exactly. for entertainment, who wins, exactly. who loses. Exactly. Yes. And if you look at the comments on any debate that takes place, the people who watch the debate from both sides will analyze it differently and each one will think my group has won. Yes. Nobody watches that type of debate to actually be convinced or a very small group of people. Yes. The default is that akhlaq and kindness is how people's hearts are attracted. Then you bring in the intellectual arguments. Mm. Yeah, when we see the sira from Prophet so exactly Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Exactly my point. So what is the future of Islam in the West is a very good question. I am optimistic overall. And I believe that inshallah ta'ala uh, there will be a resurgence of a Muslim, the Muslim community. There will be a production of even Islamic thought and content that will benefit even the East because our challenges are, we are the cutting edge and what is happening here is going to then happen in the other places in the world. So how we solve the problems will actually impact how they solve the problems. Mm. So I am optimistic, but there's a lot of work we have to do. So overall, I'm optimistic because... Alhamdulillah, the Western world, by and large, it has given us the freedoms to be Muslims. It has given us the freedom to practice our faith, and we're grateful for that. At the same time, the Western world is realizing that morally they are decaying. Spiritually, they are bankrupt. And this is why we are seeing so many prominent people convert to Islam. We are seeing just a rise of converts come because that emptiness that you know has been stripped away from their culture and society they thought that they found, you know, enlightenment and, and post-enlightenment. In reality, they realized that, you know, they, they don't have anything. You know, if you want to go back uh, to Nietzsche, one of your own guys here, right? What did Nietzsche say is that by killing God, they have killed themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't realize it, you know, and, you know, yeah, thus, thus spoke Zarathustra. What does he say in this, right? Yeah, 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 of yeah. course. So this is the point that Western civilization has not realized that by killing spirituality, they have in effect committed spiritual suicide. So here is where it becomes imperative that the ummah simply remains in its course to be role models. Good akhla, good spirituality, and the rest of the people will see this reality. And we already see this in America. The far right, 20 years ago, was our worst enemy. Now, more and more people are saying, we misunderstood, these are the good guys. Mm. More and more people are converting to Islam, or at the least saying, my God, we didn't understand. Actually, you're the guys, you're our best allies. Family values, anti this, anti that. You know I mean? That's what they're seeing now. Mm. So what, what, what do we have to do? Just remain Salat al mustaqim Don't change that. Mm. Yeah, I have uh, a question also in this field. My view in Germany is that the Muslims here are very strong in ibadah, but in akhlaq, they're very, very, uh, not, not so good. Yeah, here's the irony or the strange thing. When it comes to ibadat, generally speaking, Allah will forgive much more. When it comes to mu'amalat, the forgiveness is more difficult. Mm. Why? Because if you cheat somebody, steal somebody, lie, backbite, if you hurt somebody's feelings un unjustly, on the day of judgment, that person has to forgive you. And where you, where you find all the persons? Where will you... No, well, you when you die, then the it's person, too late. But the, uh, person, the person will have to forgive you. And that person, why will he forgive you? He wants, he wants to take from you. He wants your good deeds. So in fact, if you fall short in ibadat, it's not a good thing. I'm not saying it's a good thing. But forgiveness is much easier because it's between you and Allah. And Allah is ghafoor. And Allah is rahman. And Allah is rahim. And we know of the case of you know, somebody who did so many sins, the process was that, and he just said, Ya Rab, I committed a sin. Allah says, you're forgiven. But if you have slapped somebody, hit somebody, punched somebody, stole somebody, lied somebody, you have 15 people on the day of judgment. 
And each one's gonna say, Gimme, 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 gimme. The Prophet said, Hadith is a beautiful hadith. He said, Do you know who is the bankrupt person? Amen. Yeah, you know the hadith. Yeah, so he said, the bankrupt, they, they said the bankrupt is the guy who has too many debts, he doesn't have enough money. He said, No. The bankrupt person, he comes with a mountain of good deeds, ibadat. 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 But he has also cursed somebody, backbited Back somebody, binding. slandered somebody, stolen from somebody, hit somebody. Every one of these people say, Give me. And his good deeds will be given, 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 given until he becomes bankrupt and he has nothing left. Then he will be thrown into Jahannam. That's the bankrupt person. What does this tell you? Ibadat, Mu'amalat, what does it tell you? Yeah, of course. So then I advise the Muslims to, yes, do the ibadat. But if you forget the Mu'amalat, if you forget the akhlaq, that is potentially a bigger issue. Because as I explained, as I explained why, understand what I'm trying to say, nobody should say yeah. it. <laughs> the khala, yeah. That... Allah, His nature is to forgive. So any shortcomings we have, it's much easier to be forgiven. Man, His nature is not to forgive. Yeah. This is the difference. Human being is... When someone lives the life for 20 years, he backbiting, he steal people, and he make tawbah. And we say after that, he don't find all people. Yes, very to, easy. To ask what for you forgiveness. Can do, very easy. What you can do is be generous to other people oh. and in your heart expect that, oh Allah, this generosity, let it be a kafara for the evil that I have done. This is a way. For yes, yes, yes. Oh, if you cannot find the people, okay. if you don't know, like, you know, people have done things yeah, in the past. 13 years. You, okay, you don't know. You, don't yeah. know. you bankrupt you some people, yeah. you steal so some people. You can say that, oh Allah, the good deed I'm doing here, it should make up. So you can give it to that person. Okay. Because now that will make up what I have done. Okay, so that, that the people uh, they they now see this and have, uh, for example, this uh, back time in the back they uh, did something like this. Their their chances from the moment now, exactly to be to be very positive to people to be exactly to yes. help people. That's maybe equalize. Yes. Oh, subhanallah. I don't know. With that before. intention. With that, that intention. With the niyat. That, yeah, with the niyat that I want to erase all of that sin and. Allah Azza wa Jal can give these good deeds. I'm helping 10 orphans. Ya Rab, I stole from 10 people. This should be given to them. But so that to be clear, when uh, when the chance is there to go to the people to ask, of course, for, yes, then they have yes, to do it. Yes. If you, you, you see it, because they don't it's know. hard. Yes. You know, it's hard to go to someone well, and say, well, hey, well, well, I steal. Well, if they don't want to do it, there is another way. And that is that they make in their own mind a sincere, a sincere calculation that, look, what is the financial, for example, penalty that I think is fair given my income because it's all percentage and income based because the one who earns uh, 5,000 is not the, like the same the one who earns 50,000, right? Yes. What is the financial penalty that I think is fair for the crime that I have done in this person's case? And he makes this and Allah is his witness and judge then he'll say, okay, this much I will give to a very good cause but I want Allah to reward that person, not me. So the niyyah mm. will be It's also a way. Yes, because you don't have to tell that person. But your assessment has to be correct or better than correct. Because if you shortchange, because on the day of judgment, he can then say, ya, ya Allah, I want from him. And you can say, but Ya Allah, I've already done it. You see? So you have to be fair that what is the penalty that you slandered somebody, you said something and you knew it was a lie. You're like, you know, that was a lie. I need to make up for it. But it's too... It's going to be too painful to go back, whatever it might be, you know. Like, or he didn't know, and you backbite it. He didn't know, and if you go and you tell him, it's going to maybe cause bigger problems. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're like, you know what? Let me just say this is fair. Or fair. I'm just giving an example: one thousand euros. Let's just say, I'm just giving an example. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. So, so let me just give this and give it to the fuqara, to the masakin, feed the hungry people. But then the niya is, ya Rab, all of this ajr, all of this reward. I wanted to go to him because I wronged him. And Allah knows your niyyah. And if you're sincere mm. and you made a sincere calculation that really Allah knows you really made a sincere calculation, alhamdulillah, you're done. That means, for example, he steal from me 15,000 euro. Yeah. I, 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 and he called me and he said, hey, I know I go to Hajj, forgive me for everything. And I say, okay, khoya khalas is forgiven, no problem. But mm. I don't know what I, I forgive. Yeah. If you do this for the sake of Allah, because here's the point. Allah will reward you for every pain and tragedy that you've suffered. If somebody stole money from you, you will get ajr for that. 
But if you don't forgive him, that ajr will come from his bank account. And you will say, no, I went on the day of judgment. So his good deeds will be transferred to you. Mm. If you do forgive for the sake of Allah, Allah is ghafoor and rahim. Allah will give you from his. And when he gives you, <laughs> he will give much better. <laughs> but you have a grudge against him, <laughs> yeah. see? Because you want him to suffer. Like, no, your bank account. But you don't realize Allah's hisab is much bigger. And yeah, the human being is very, uh, subhanAllah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, this is a good question. How should we handle it when other Muslims oppose the message of Islam? Understand, we should not say they're opposing Islam. If they oppose Islam, they're kafir. Okay. They're not opposing Islam, they're opposing you. And you are not Islam, I am not Islam. Mm. So when somebody criticizes me, somebody makes fun of me, somebody labels me, inshallah, he's, Allah, he's not opposing Allah and his messenger. We need to, we need to simply, allow, look, you have to, so listen to what they're saying. If the person is reputable and the criticism has an element of truth, then you need to have internal hisab and realize and correct yourself. And if the person is not reputable or it doesn't have any truth or merit, khalas, you have to always have the better akhlaq and adab. You cannot stoop to their level. You cannot. And don't take a fellow Muslim as an enemy, even if he takes you as an enemy. Okay. They are your brother in Islam. And Allah. make dua for them, have the better akhlaq, and always in any situation, you always should try to have the better manners than the other person. And if you do so, Allah will bless you and Allah will put barakah in your life and Allah Azza wa Jal will, will allow people to see you for who you are and see that person for who he is. Okay. Okay, Sheikh. Sheikh, thank you for this episode. It's a very honor for us and may Allah not take you back till he is pleased with you. Ameen. Jazakallah khair. Beautiful dua. Ameen. And you as well. Jazakallah khair. Danke. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Alhamdulillah. Thank you. Danke für einschalten. Das war die Folge mit Dr. Yasser Qadir und bis zum nächsten Mal.